Hey there, YouTube fam. Welcome to Reveal Truth, the channel that sheds light on the dark secrets hidden behind unfaithful wives. Today, we've got a story that will make your jaw drop to the floor. Let's begin. Today's story is about strong man and wife who doesn't deserve our respect. If you listen till the end, you will hear wife's confession story. So, he was very happy with his life, but after 15 years of marriage, something bad happened something that threatened to change everything and deeply hurt his two daughters. Let's delve into the story. My name is Ron Willie. I've been married for 15 years and was content with our family life. I was certain my wife loved me deeply. Over the years, our marriage had flourished. We were blessed with two lovely daughters in their early teens. Both of us had good jobs, she worked as a voice translator for a film studio, and I was employed by a security company. I adored my wife and knew she was wholly devoted to me. We were all in good health, residing in a beautiful house in a reputable part of a city. Life was good, and I felt things couldn't get much better. Lily, my wife, had gained weight after the birth of our second daughter, and hadn't been able to shed it completely. She had mesmerizing blue eyes, magnified by the large lenses of her glasses. She didn't wear contact lenses as they irritated her eyes, especially during reading her paperwork. This made her eyes appear even larger and more captivating. I was deeply in love with her, and I knew she felt the same about me. We had two wonderful daughters, a comfortable home, and financial stability. However, after 15 blissful years of marriage, something dire occurred something that threatened to upend our harmonious life. For the past couple of years, Lily had developed a routine of going out with her colleagues. They had a few favorite pubs they frequented, rotating their choices. They usually visited these places after work on alternate Fridays. Lily often told me they went out just to chat and relax. I had no qualms about her outings, I was home by 4.30pm every day and took care of our daughters during her absence. On the evening she went out, I prepared dinner for our daughters and assist them with their homework a task I genuinely enjoyed. Typically, she'd return by 8pm, and we spend the rest of the weekend together, indulging in family activities and dining out on Saturday evenings. However, over the past few months, I noticed a change. Lily started coming home later from her outings, often closer to 10pm, and I could sense that she was having a few drinks. Of course, I didn't say anything since she was still the loving wife she had always been. Each time she got home after those evenings out, she always had that typical smile on her face, that made me want to hug her. I knew that going out like that with her friends was her way to relax. It was taking her mind away from the long week of hard work. I told myself that she was just having harmless fun with the group of girls she was working with, and I saw nothing wrong with it, even if she was now getting home later than usual. Then, one Monday morning a few weeks ago, I received an email from someone who had simply signed it, a friend. I came close to deleting the message without reading it, but on second thought, I took the time to read it. It went like this. I was at the Black Crow last Friday evening. I saw your wife there with a group of people. I must say she was enjoying herself a lot. I also saw her dancing with one of the men in her group. He danced with her almost exclusively. I thought you would like to see how she is enjoying herself this evening, so I took a picture of her using my cell phone. Watch the picture carefully, and if you still think there is nothing wrong with the way she danced, then just forget it. Accompanying the email was an attachment that I needed to open to see the picture. Why would someone bother to send it to me if there was nothing special about it? This email had already planted a seed of doubt in my mind, and I feared what I was about to discover. In it, I was informed that Lily had been dancing when she went out with the girls. There were also male co-workers with them, something she had never mentioned to me. I had always been under the impression that she was only with female colleagues. Of course, she could have been dancing with someone already at the Black Crow, someone not from their group. Still, a lump formed in my throat, and I began to feel uneasy about the whole situation. Against my better judgment, I decided to open the attachment. The moment the picture appeared on the screen, I noticed it wasn't perfectly centered. It seemed as if the person taking the photo had been cautious, trying not to be observed. In the background, I could see my wife's co-workers, both females and males, seated at a long table. The image was somewhat blurred, but I could still make out my wife on the dance floor to the right. She was wearing her beige blouse adorned with red flowers and green leaves, paired with matching brown slacks. This was the outfit Lily had worn the last time she went out with the girls. I realized the photo must have been taken the previous Friday. That evening, she had come home later than usual, around half past ten, greeting me with her familiar smile. In the picture, she was on the dance floor, wrapped in the arms of a tall young man. They were pressed closely together, with Lily's arms encircling his neck. To say I was shocked would be an understatement. I couldn't recall ever dancing with Lily, or anyone for that matter, in such an intimate manner. She must have felt it his thing in the pants. 
Surely, any man would find it hard to remain unaffected in such a situation. Yet, Lily didn't seem to mind. On the contrary, judging by the joyful smile on her lips, she appeared to be reciprocating his advances. As they gazed deeply into each other's eyes, my wife, my Lily, the mother of my two daughters, was embracing a stranger so intimately in public. I was in disbelief. I knew she wouldn't even dance with me like that in public. Why was she allowing a stranger or was he truly a stranger? To act this way with her. The seed of doubt was now deeply rooted in my mind, growing uncontrollably. Imagined scenarios of my wife with other men began to flood my thoughts. I felt a wave of nausea and rushed to the bathroom, emptying my breakfast into the toilet. Was Lily behaving so recklessly in public? Was she having an affair? How could she betray me and our two daughters? A barrage of questions overwhelmed me. Who was this man? Did he work with her? How long had this been going on? Was she deceiving me? I was determined to uncover the truth and find concrete evidence of what was transpiring. For the next half hour, I secluded myself in my office bathroom, attempting to process my emotions. A whirlwind of feelings emerged. Disappointment, sadness, anger, and a burning desire for revenge. I was caught in a maelstrom of reactions. Part of me wanted to confront Lily angrily, while another part yearned to embrace her and plead with her to explain. I wanted to divorce her. One moment, the thought consumed me, and the next, I'd forgive her, giving her another chance. As I sat on the toilet seat, I felt as though I was losing my mind. Eventually, I regained control and decided to wait, to observe Lily and see what would unfold before taking any action. There was no point in making an emotionally charged decision without knowing the full story. I needed to be patient and not confront her with my suspicions. At the same time, I was determined to uncover the truth. I needed solid proof. Was she cheating, or was it innocent fun? I knew she had lied by omission about her nights out with her friends. Her movie studio was just a few blocks from my office. Given that I was often on the road for work, it was easy for me to keep an eye on her. The next day, at 11.30 a.m., I parked at the far end of her workplace's parking lot. My company car had tinted windows, ensuring I remained unseen. I waited until 1 p.m., but she never emerged. I repeated this stakeout for the rest of the week. On Friday, at 12.15 p.m., I saw Lily and three others a woman and two men get into a black BMW. Lily sat in the front, and they drove off. Naturally, I trailed them. They headed downtown and eventually parked at a posh restaurant. I observed them laughing as they entered. I parked across the street, watching intently. When they left around 2 p.m., Lily was walking closely with a tall, light-haired man the same one from a photo I'd seen. Their intimacy infuriated me. They returned to her workplace, and all went inside. While she hadn't done anything overtly wrong, she had failed to mention dining with male colleagues. Their behavior suggested they were couples, not just friends or co-workers. This bothered me the most. That evening, Lily returned home by 5.15 p.m., her usual cheerful self. It took immense self-control not to interrogate her. However, I did ask about her day and lunch. She hesitated briefly before claiming she ate the tuna sandwich she packed that morning. I knew she was lying. Despite my anger, I felt a pull towards her. Love does that. I shifted the conversation to my day, trying to maintain normalcy. The weekend was pleasant. We visited the zoo with our daughters, momentarily pushing aside my suspicions. The following week, I decided to follow her on Friday evening. After ensuring our daughters were settled, I headed to Lily's workplace. At 5 p.m., she left, driving in the opposite direction of our home. I knew she was heading to a pub for her girls' night out. I trailed her discreetly, with several cars between us, all heading towards what I presumed was a popular local spot. Ten minutes later, I watched as Lily's Toyota and the other six cars entered the parking lot of a combined bar and restaurant called The Glass Shoe. I parked my car at the opposite end. Once everyone was inside, I stepped out to survey the area. It never hurts to familiarize oneself with the surroundings, especially when tailing someone. The pub was relatively isolated, with parking spaces surrounding it. Two sides faced the street since the glass shoe was situated on a corner. The other two sides were bordered by a well-trimmed five-foot-high cedar hedge, in front of which were more parking spaces. I then spotted the black BMW that Lily had ridden in the previous Friday. It was parked near the cedar hedge, away from the other vehicles. The building had separate entrances. One for the restaurant and another for the bar. At the back, there were emergency exits for both sections. Another entrance on the side led to the bar, but Lily's group had used the restaurant door. Returning to my car, I changed into a disguise I had prepared. A baseball cap, black windbreaker, glasses, and a protective mouthpiece similar to what boxers use. This would alter my facial features slightly. Checking my reflection in the rearview mirror, I was confident I wouldn't be recognized. 
After waiting another hour, I entered the bar. Lily's group was near the dance floor, enjoying drinks and laughter. The group consisted of six women and four men. Seeing my wife sitting intimately close to the same man she had dined with the previous Friday filled me with sadness and disappointment. I took a seat in a dimly lit section at the back where I could observe without drawing attention. It wasn't long before the music started and people flocked to the dance floor. Among them, I saw Lily dancing with the man. The other three men at their table watched with knowing smiles. It was clear to me that Lily and this man were more than just friends. After a couple of hours, only Lily, another woman, and two men remained from the original group. The rest had left. Both couples were on the dance floor. My wife had her arms around the man's neck, and he held her close. To any observer, it was evident they were lovers, barely moving to the rhythm of the music. They just stood there, rubbing their bodies against each other. Then, I saw him kiss her. He whispered something in her ear, and I watched her nod in agreement. They immediately left the building, holding hands. I followed them out. By then, it was already quite dark outside. From my vantage point, I saw them walk hand in hand toward his car. I understood why he had chosen to park his car in the last row of the parking lot, so close to the cedar hedge. He knew he wouldn't be disturbed there. With no other cars nearby and a hedge shielding the back of his vehicle, he probably felt safe. I wondered, what were they planning to do? How far was Lily willing to go? I knew I had to find out. I carefully made my way to the other end of the parking lot, then approached the cedar hedge. Staying close to the five-foot-high hedge, I stealthily moved toward their car, using parked vehicles as cover. Soon, I was right behind his BMW. At first, I couldn't see anyone inside. Then it dawned on me. They were likely on the back seat. Given the darkness near the hedge, I felt confident they wouldn't spot me from inside the car. I moved closer and tried to peer through one of the back windows, but the deep tin prevented me from seeing anything. However, I could hear muffled voices from inside. Torn between intervening immediately or catching Lily red-handed, I hesitated. But my decision was made for me when I noticed the car moving in a rhythmic manner. My heart raced with anger. I reached for the door handle and flung it open. The roof light suddenly flooded the inside of the car. I saw my wife, Lily, lying on her back with her lover on top of her. They were playing. I had previously removed my fake glasses and taken out the protective denture from my mouth. As soon as the light came on inside the car, Lily's eyes opened wide, and she looked straight at me. I actually saw the expression on her face change from one of bliss to one of shock in just a few short seconds. After a few more moments, all she could manage to say in a raspy voice was, Oh God, Ron, I'm sorry. Then, in a much more urgent and louder tone, she pleaded, Don't do anything you'll regret later. I beg you. This meant nothing to me. Wait for me, I'm going home right now. Ron. For all I care, you can go straight to hell, you cheating bee, and take lover boy here with you. I slammed the door shut and turned around, walking straight to my car. By the time I was pulling away from the parking lot, Lily was already halfway to my car, shouting at me to wait for her. Update 1. Now she wants Opus to forgive her. Let's see what Opus did. Lily entered the house less than 5 minutes after I arrived. She looked terrible. Her hair was in disarray, and her beige skirt and white blouse were completely wrinkled. She slowly walked up to me, tears in her eyes, and said, Oh God, honey, I am so sorry. I love you more than life itself. I know I've hurt you terribly. You broke our marriage vows, Lily. I've never cheated on you once in the 15 years we've been married. Had I known that you were seeing someone behind my back, I could have done the same. If I'd known you didn't value the fidelity part of our marriage vows, I could have sought some cheap thrills too. Please listen to me, Ron. I love you, and what I did meant nothing to me. I wish I could undo it all, but it's not possible. You must believe me. You are my world. My life pales in comparison to you and our two daughters. She then broke into tears, pressing her face into her hands as if trying to hide. Eventually, she had to sit on the couch, her legs no longer able to support her. All the while, she kept repeating how sorry she was. Stop telling me you're sorry. What you did to our marriage is unforgivable. Tell me who he is and how long this has been going on. I felt slightly more at ease now that Lily had moved to the couch. While she stood before me, I had an overwhelming urge to grip her neck and shake her. Never before in my life had I felt such anger. It even surprised me. His name doesn't matter Ron. He's someone from the studio. This should never have happened. You must believe me. I love you more than my own life. But you do realize you said you were out with the girls. Those evenings have been going on for two years. Am I to believe you've been seeing him all that time? Oh God, no. I haven't been doing it for that long. Believe me, what I did didn't diminish our marriage. I love you more today than I ever have. Please forgive me and try to understand. There was never any love involved in what I did. 
she began crying again. She looked terrible sitting there, her eyes swollen and red, begging me to forgive her. You are the one who doesn't seem to understand. What do you think those co-workers of yours think of me, and of you, now that they have seen you give another man what is rightly mine? Can you imagine the way they will look at me if they see us together, either on the street or at one of your office parties? This is not just a secret affair you were having with someone who works with you. No, this is a public display of your arrogant cheating. You were telling the whole world you were fooling me. I am sorry, but I cannot live with that. Ron, please don't do this to me. You know that I can't live without you. Please don't talk like that. I want you to forgive me. This will never, ever happen again. I solemnly swear this to you. Saving our marriage and our family is all that counts now. While she was talking, I had gotten up and turned my back to her, getting ready to leave since I needed time to think. What marriage, Lily? You destroyed our marriage the very first time you opened your legs for another man. What is happening today is the result of that very first betrayal. All of a sudden, I heard a loud moan followed by a plaintive cry, the likes of which I had never heard before. When I looked at Lily, she was lying on the floor with her head hidden in her arms. I could see her back shaking as she cried in desperation. Once again, I had a strong urge to take her into my arms and hug her, but at the same time, the anger I felt and especially the feeling of betrayal, were both too strong. I no longer trusted myself to remain near her. Instead, I quietly left the house and went to spend the night in a hotel room. I didn't sleep at all that night. The next morning, I called my secretary and told her I wouldn't be going to work that day. I remained in my room until noon. Then, after eating a few bites at the hotel restaurant, I drove in front of my house on my way toward my office. There was a green Toyota parked in the driveway. I realized that it belonged to Francie, Lily's sister. At least, I told myself, my two daughters had the company of their aunt, besides that of my cheating wife. It did make me feel a little better. But what I didn't know yet was the fact that Lily was now in the hospital. After I left the house the previous evening, while she was explaining to her sister on the phone what had happened, she went into a fit and had suffered a nervous breakdown. It was only once I got into my office that I learned what had happened. Lily's sister, Francine, phoned me, and we had a long talk together. She said Lily was a nervous wreck and crying all the time. It seems that less than an hour after I left the house the previous evening, my eldest daughter had phoned to tell Francine that Lily was delirious, and I was not home. Francine then talked to her sister, and she immediately drove to my house. When she realized the condition her sister was in, she immediately called an ambulance. Francine told me she was still at my house and would be taking care of my two daughters for a few days. She also insisted that I go and see my wife at Santa Mary's hospital in town. After I hung up, I was beyond shock. Had I acted selfishly the previous evening? Had I not left the house, leaving my daughters and my wife when they all needed me the most? Maybe. But one thing I did know. Had I remained in the house with her that evening, there is a possibility, however small, that I could have turned violent because of what she had done. Yes, she may have destroyed our marriage, but until yesterday, I didn't consider myself as one of those men who hit their head in the sand when faced with the problem. Was this exactly what I had done? Lily and I had a big problem, of course, a huge one at that. But was it a reason for me to just abandon my family when they needed me the most? I was now feeling very bad. As I sat there behind my desk, I began to cry, wondering deep inside if I could have done things in another, better way. But forgiveness and even reconciliation is a remote possibility. Of course, this whole mess was one of Lily's making. She was completely responsible for giving to another man what should have been mine only. But breaking my marriage was going to hurt my two daughters too much. There had to be another solution. And this is when I got the idea of forgiveness with retribution. As soon as I recovered enough from the shock of learning that Lily was in the hospital, I was in my car and driving toward the hospital. I had absolutely no idea what I was going to say to her, but one thing was certain. I was going to face the situation and find out exactly what she had done. Now, Lily's confession story. I am currently lying in a hospital bed, and a thought entered my mind. It was something my mother used to tell us. Cheaters always get caught, one way or another. Ron and I got married when I was 20, and we were perfectly happy. We had two wonderful daughters and lived in a beautiful house in a great neighborhood. Money wasn't an issue, but more importantly, I loved my husband, and I knew he loved me too. When my youngest daughter was six, I secured a job at a film studio not far from where my husband worked. With the fall of the Iron Curtain and the gradual democratization of communism, there was a tremendous demand from the people of Russia for US films. Since I was fluent in Russian and had acted in small plays during my university years, I managed to get a job as a female voice translator for English films, translating them into Russian. It was a fantastic job, the pay was good, and I excelled at what I did. 
Five years into my tenure, a new voice translator named Victor Janinko joined our team. He was a tall, young man in his late twenties with dark blonde hair and striking looks. Many of the women at the studio were smitten by him, but he seemed oblivious to the attention. Victor was born in the US, but his grandparents had migrated to America at the end of WW2. His parents always spoke Russian at home, so he was perfectly bilingual. As a result, he and I often collaborated, and a deep friendship blossomed between us. This is where my troubles began. Before I realized it, I found myself falling for him. Initially, he treated me like he did the other women at work, discussing professional matters and collaborating effectively. However, he soon began joining us on our alternate Friday outings. Our relationship quickly evolved beyond mere professional camaraderie. We became good friends. He told me all about himself, and I shared the story of my life with him. I even confided in him things I had never shared with my husband. Until Vic started joining us, our outings were exclusively girls' nights. But once he became a regular, other girls began bringing their boyfriends or husbands. The first mistake I made was not informing Ron that our girls' night out had evolved into a mixed gathering. Perhaps, deep down, I enjoyed Vic's company and didn't want to share his attention with my husband on those nights. Soon, the friendship between Vic and me deepened. We danced together constantly. One evening, as we swayed to a slow song, I found myself tightly in his embrace in a dim corner of the dance floor. Unexpectedly, he kissed me. It wasn't a friendly or familial pack, it was intimate. I was taken aback. That marked the beginning. The next Friday, he found a reason to lead me away from the pub, and we found ourselves getting intimate in his car. Our passion escalated, and our encounters became more frequent. Every time I returned home, Gil consumed me. I tried to compensate by showering Ron with all the love I thought he deserved. What I failed to realize was that Ron, as my husband, deserved my undivided love. None of it should have been given to Vic. Working with Vic daily made it challenging to maintain distance. Even at work, when no one was around, we find moments to embrace and kiss. We grew very comfortable with each other. I need to clarify that, from my perspective, my relationship with Vic didn't diminish my love for Ron. I still would have given my life for him. I had absolutely no intention of hurting him with my affair with Vic. How wrong I was. Making love with Vic was certainly not better than making love with my husband. By the time my husband found out about my affair with Vic, we had been lovers for four months. I didn't love him like I loved my husband, of course, but the sex with him was fantastic. The fact that I could let go of myself when I was with him made all the difference. When I was making love with my husband, I had to restrain myself since I didn't want him to think of me as loose. But with Vic, I had no such restrictions since I didn't care what he thought about me. This was the main reason I did things with Vic that I had never done with my husband. I suppose Vic and I were extremely negligent and careless in the way we acted in front of our co-workers. Of course, it didn't matter that much to Vic since he wasn't married. But because of the way we were acting in public, it was only a matter of time before my husband found out about me and Vic from a jealous co-worker. We should have been more discreet. But I know now that even if Ron had never learned of my affair, it would still have been terribly wrong. That evening when Ron caught us was by far the worst moment of my life. When Ron shouted at me that I could go to hell and bring my lover with me, just before he turned to move away from the car, I knew that my marriage was in deep trouble. I even stepped on Vic with both feet in my hurry to leave his car, so that I could catch up with my husband. But I was too late. By the time I was halfway to his car, he was speeding away, leaving me standing there in the middle of the parking lot. Up to that time, I considered my love for Ron like a fire that burned only for him, and I knew he felt the same. Then one day, when Vic entered my life and kissed me for the first time, it was like a spark from that fire reignited another fire, and this one began to burn for Vic. These emotions I felt for Vic didn't take anything away from the love I felt for my husband. I told myself it was just like when my youngest daughter was born. I loved her with all my heart, and it didn't reduce the love I still had for my eldest daughter. What stupid things we tell ourselves to justify our basic sturges. Children don't expect a parent to love only them. We never vow to our children to forsake all others. Yes, the love of a parent for a child is far different from the love one should have for their spouse. But I made certain those thoughts never reached my consciousness while I played my games with Vic. I know that my husband certainly doesn't see it the same way I did, and I don't blame him. I understand that if the roles were reversed and he was the one with another woman in his life, I would be devastated. Human thoughts and emotions are so mysterious, and sometimes we shouldn't try to reason them. So now, I am here in a hospital bed. Each time I wake from my dreamless rest, I start thinking about the events of the last few months. I cry and feel sorry for myself. Then the nurse injects me again with something, and I sleep once more a wonderful sleep that allows me to forget everything. 
I wish that I could never wake up again and be at peace with myself. But each time, just before I pass out, I see a picture of Ron and me on our wedding day. Oh God, help me. My children, my husband I can't leave them. I must fight that urge to hide on the other side. Life is a never-ending combat. My father once told me, if you stop fighting, then you had no right to be living in the first place. I am alive. Ron and my daughters are alive. And I will also live. After all, they are the loves of my life. Yes, I will fight for my husband and my family. To me, Vic is just dirt now. He had absolutely no right to be in my life in the first place. If Ron lets me, I will once again, and for the rest of my life, be the faithful wife I used to be. When I wake up, how long in the future I don't know, but I will come back into my family's world. Of that, I am certain. When I do, the first thing I hope to see is my husband standing there in front of me, so that I can start the difficult task of making it up to him. I don't know how many days I have to stay here in this hospital bed, but I beg everyone to pray for Ron and our daughters. Thanks for listening our story today. And I hope you enjoyed it. Now share your opinion in comments and don't forget to subscribe my channel. Cheers.